Good afternoon, thank you for being with us. I'm gonna be reading from Isaiah 53, three through 10. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. As of one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he was born of our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter and like a sheep that before its shears is silent. So he opened not his mouth. By oppression and judgment, he was taken away. And as for his generation, who considered that he was cut off out of the land of the living, stricken for the transgression of my people. And they made him, they made his grave with the wicked and with the rich man in his death. Although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, yet it was the will of the Lord to crush him. He has put him to grief. When his soul makes an offering for guilt, he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Precious blood, who is love will not. 
Praise God for the ultimate perfect love that Jesus demonstrated. Uh, we're going to read together. The first slide, I'm going to read it. And then the second one, uh, you guys are going to read. And then the last slide, we will read together. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. He is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the Most High, uh, the, the Majesty on High. For by a single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. We have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the earth, that is through Jesus Christ. We have a great priest over the house of God. Together, let us hold fast the confession of our faith without wavering for he who comes. Amen.
power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? Why should I gain? Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that he should give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. Friends, last weekend, Pastor Jerry shared with us about the testing of Abraham from Genesis 22. If you were here, you saw the image on the screens of Abraham with a knife in his hand raised over Isaac who laid on a stone bound there. An angel of the Lord intervenes at the last moment, delivers Isaac, and provides a ram, another sacrifice. We learned that the episode was a picture of Christ's sacrifice that was fulfilled on Good Friday, which we observe today. Of course, a picture doesn't capture the full reality of a moment, and so we have to look deeper today into the passion of Christ to understand all that happened on that Good Friday. Sacrifice is a good starting place, but we also have to explore the willingness of Christ to walk that path, and then what it meant, the finality of it. Here in the 21st century, the idea of sacrifice, certainly animal sacrifice, is foreign to us, but it has deep roots in God's covenant relationship with his people. The premise is that through through the death of the animal, sin is transferred to that animal, and the person making the sacrifice is forgiven. He is, in fact, restored to relationship with God. We see this sacrificial system at work in Genesis 15 when God forms his covenant with Abram. It's developed later in Exodus 12 when the Passover lamb is sacrificed, its blood placed on the doorposts and lintels of the Israelites' homes, protecting them from the angel of death, a substitutionary sacrifice. And it becomes ingrained into the life of the worshiping community in Leviticus 1 through 5 as we learn about burnt offerings and grain offerings and peace offerings, sin offerings, and yes, guilt offerings. Given its place in the worshiping community, You could be forgiven for thinking that sacrifice was so important to God. But in reality, he is so much more concerned with our obedience than he is with our sacrifice. When God spoke to Moses in Exodus 19, 5 to 6, he said, Now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice, keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine. You shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. This relationship with God demands holiness, which comes through obedience. And when our obedience falters, when we break covenant with God, a price must be paid because God can't ignore sin. A sacrifice becomes necessary. On Good Friday, we recognize and honor Jesus' willing sacrifice, the perfect Passover lamb motivated by love who gave his life to pay the price for our sins. Now we know there is so much that Jesus teaches us through his earthly ministry, but but on Good Friday, one of the most important things that we can learn is what it looks like to have a heart of complete submission to the Father, perfect obedience. Scripture shows us that Jesus was fully aware of his coming arrest and crucifixion. The Gospel of Matthew gives us no less than four different moments when Chapter 16, 17, 20, and 26, when he tells his disciples what's coming. 
In Matthew 20, 18 to 19, he says, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and scribes, and they'll condemn him to death, and deliver him over to the Gentiles to be mocked and flogged and crucified, and he will be raised in the third day. Not only does he know what's coming, he moves towards it. Luke 9, 51 says, When the days drew near for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. And finally, in John 10, we understand what Jesus was thinking and feeling at a deeper level. He, he walked this path by his own choice. In verses 17 to 18, he says, For this reason the Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me. I lay it down of my own accord. Facing his death, Jesus consistently reveals to us a clarity of purpose and a depth of conviction which appears divine. But in the journey to the cross, we see so much more of Jesus. At this late hour of his ministry, we see his empathy as he tries to prepare the disciples. We see his heaviness when he's faced with the faceless crowds. We see his patience when his disciples revert to arguing about who's the greatest. We see his humility as he enters Jerusalem, yes, on the colt of a donkey. And we see his passion for God's honor as he clears the temple and calls out the hypocrisy of the scribes and the Pharisees. We see Jesus' humanity time and again. And perhaps the most intensely human moment in Scripture comes to us through tears and sorrow and prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane. Matthew 26, verses 39 and 42. And going a little farther, he fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. And again, for the second time, he went away and prayed, My father, if this cannot pass unless I drink it, your will be done. Jesus is fully God. Fully man. He has agency, he has authority, he also has power. He's also experiencing pain and struggle and deep sorrow. But he shows us the highest love, the deepest obedience when he refrains from using that power to his own advantage. Instead, he submits to the Father, and the stage is set for the greatest turning point in history. As we consider Jesus' perfect obedience in this moment, we have to ask ourselves, how willing am I to obey? Can I set aside my agenda for the next five hours, the next five years, so that God's will can be done through my life? Do I face my trials with confidence that God is working out something larger than I can see? Do I love the Lord with all of my heart, all of my mind, all of my soul, all of my strength? Our hesitation reveals that the stain of sin, sin still clings to us. We try to be good. We seek to be loving. But just like the disciples in the garden, friends, more times than not, our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. But thanks be to God that Jesus is strong in both spirit and flesh, and his willing sacrifice opens the door for all of our forgiveness. His willing sacrifice brings atonement with the Father. Friends, today I hope you think and ponder on this, that Jesus' sacrifice, yes, it makes him worthy of our reverence and our worship, but his willing obedience, that humbles us, that stirs something deeper, love, affection, and conviction that it's precisely Jesus' willingness to suffer to the point of death on a cross that confirms that Jesus is who he said he was, the Son of Man, the Son of God, and our Messiah. Behold the man upon a cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished.
as Pastor Dan was preaching and doing such a great job, thank you for highlighting the willingness of Jesus. I was reminded with this red coming from the cross that in the Old Testament, at Passover, on the very first one, they were to put the blood on the doorpost, the lentil on the doorpost. They did not put it on the threshold because no one should step on the blood. No one tramples on that. And I was so glad when you walked around and went up here. But that's, a, that's an important thing for all of us. We came here today to worship. I came here today to reflect, to bring my own broken life before him once again. For by his stripes, we have been healed. The sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice that we've come to remember was, yes, predicted, was necessary, it was willing, it was perfect. And I would like you to think about this. It was final, yes. final. Let's go back to the beginning of time. The history of humanity is a trail of blood and death. And it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Listen to the biblical narrative out of the book of Genesis. When Adam and Eve had disobeyed God's one command, it's the only one he had for them, and they couldn't even keep that one. And now they were cast into the blackness of sin. And the Bible says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves, hid themselves, hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. What follows is God's words and God's judgment upon mankind and upon Satan, upon Adam, upon Eve. It was a devastating judgment for their sin. And in verse 21, it says, and the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of animal skins and clothed them, clothed them. In that moment, sin's tra tragic aftermath was massive. Guilt, shame, hiding, separation from God, expulsion from the garden, curses pronounced on creation, on Adam, on Eve, and the serpent. What was God signaling in this moment? He was signaling that sin requires death, the shedding of blood to cover it. In the New Testament book of Hebrews chapter 9, verse 22, states the unbreakable rule. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's God. From this point on, the deadly rule was fixed. God required death and the shedding of blood to forgive sins. And so all through the Old Testament, the law of Moses, we read in Leviticus chapter 9, Moses said to Aaron, draw to the altar and offer your sin offering and your burnt offering and make atonement covering for yourself and for your people and bring an offering of the people and make atonement covering for them as the Lord has 
commanded. And so from that point on and throughout the entire Old Testament period, sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice after sacrifice, day in, day out, month in, month out, seven God-appointed feasts for the Jews required sacrifice after sacrifice. And every day, the morning and the evening sacrifice. Do you realize that reason we have this service at noon is because at the sixth hour, from 6 a.m., sixth hour, that's how days are counted, darkness fell on the face of the earth. Jesus had already been on the cross. And at the ninth hour, at three in the afternoon, what does he do? He cries out. Did you know that three in the afternoon was the time of the evening sacrifice? Don't tell me the Bible isn't the word of God. Don't tell me this book has just been thrown together. Everything fits perfectly. The temple in Jerusalem, when it was there, was awash in the sacrificial blood of bulls and goats and lambs and doves. And if you could walk with me as I have with tour groups there, you would see etched in the stone there were waterways. There were places for blood and water to go away from the temple mount and out and away because so much blood was shed. It was the smell of death everywhere. But here is the most amazing fact. Hebrews chapter 10 says of all those Old Testament sacrifices, for it is impossible. What? Impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Every sacrifice from Eden's animal sacrifice to cover the sin of Adam and Eve throughout the entire Old Testament area, all of those sacrifices could not remove sin. Why did, then did God require them? What was God saying? Listen carefully. It was not those sacrifices that removed the sin. It was people who trusted in God who was going to send the final sacrifice. The trail of blood from Eden through the entire Old Testament era, era pointed to the final sacrifice. It pointed to Jesus, who we have come to honor this very day, the one final high priest who would offer himself as the final sacrifice. Hebrews 9, 24, for Christ has entered not into holy places made with hands, which are copies of the true things, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God on our behalf, nor was it to offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy places every year with blood, not his own. For then Jesus would have had to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But as it is, listen, he has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to put away, to forever abolish, to cancel out completely sin. How? By the sacrifice of himself, the Bible says. <coughs> Jesus is the only sinless sacrifice. There are no other sacrifices like him. He is the final sacrifice. There's a word that I want you to hear. Because Jesus, in Aramaic, no doubt, probably not in the Greek, but we find it in the Greek New Testament, the word that he uttered twice from the cross. Jesus uttered the word, it is finished. To telestai, to telestai. He made it 
twice he said this. Let me read John's gospel, chapter 19 for you. Verse 28, after this, Jesus, knowing that all was now to Palestine, all was now finished to fulfill the scripture, he said, I thirst. A jar full of sour wine stood there, so they put a sponge full of the sour wine on a hyssop branch. Remember hyssop? The doorposts, remember, in Passover? And held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, to tell us die. It is finished. And he bowed his head and he gave up willingly his spirit. Paid in full. Jesus, the final sacrifice for sin. Nothing more can be offered. Nothing more needs to be offered. All we need to do is to hear this wonderful news, believe it, and receive the gift that God has given to us through one final sacrifice. Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. All to him I owe. Sin had left its crimson stain. But he washed it white as snow. Amen. And amen. As we prepare ourselves to take communion, let's reflect upon the cross. A willing savior a final sacrifice, the ultimate sacrifice of all.
I'm going to ask you for the next few moments and time to stay focused. So easy for us to get distracted and think about something else uh, to put our mind on what is really inconsequential. Because for the next few moments, you're going to have an opportunity to worship the Lord in the way that he's asked us to do so and remember him. And I would like to invite those of you who are watching by live stream to find your way to the cupboard and get some bread and get some juice and get ready to also confess Jesus in the way that he's called us to do so. But here in the worship center, we're going to come and have what we call confessional communion. It's an opportunity for you to verbally confess your faith in Jesus. It's a high point in our worship. And I pray it will be a meaningful moment in your Christian walk. As you come to the table, you'll be excused by rows by the ushers if you just observe how they're leading you. Uh, that will make it more orderly and helpful. But I'd like you to prepare your heart. So if you're sitting waiting and you're listening or you're singing along, make sure that you're focused and not just letting your mind drift off. Stay reverent through this entire experience. When you come to the table, you'll be handed a spike, and the person that's at the table can turn to the person behind them and say, Jesus loved you this much, and hand it to them. A reminder of the, the nails that went through his hands and feet. And then those who will be serving you at the tables will give you um, a little, um, maybe a, a, a sentence or two homily about what this all means. And you'll be asked a question to respond to. Yes, of course. And then you may take the bread and the cup. You may take it at the table or you may take it back to your seat. It's entirely up to you. When you're ready, you take communion. And then when you return to your seats, just be reverent as others take these precious, sacred, holy moments in Holy Week and as they observe this most, most important day. And then I'll come up again at the end and wrap it all up so we can go out of this place with the right heart attitude for the rest of this weekend. And so I'd like to call the elders and pastors to take their places at these different locations right now as we prepare ourselves for that and I'd like to offer up a prayer before we begin. Would you bow your heads with me? Father, how can we possibly even begin to express our utter sense of unworthiness to have the Son of God shed his precious blood for us. And yet this is the fact that we've been faced with, guilty as we have been, and Lord, sinful as we are, you have redeemed us through the precious blood of Jesus. And for this, we give you thanks. For the broken body of Jesus torn in shreds, pierced through. And we thank you that by your stripes we are healed. And so, Lord, as we come to confess our own personal faith in you, may it sink into our hearts, Lord, in a new, fresh way for us all. I pray in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
So often people think they come to church to hear what they've done wrong. I want to tell you something. You've done what is right on this day. Well done, church. Jesus put it this way, for as often as you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you proclaim, you preach. We've all preached today. You proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. I'm waiting for Jesus to come any day. Are you? What a glorious day that will be when the church is snatched out of this wicked, dark world into the very presence of God forever. In Philippians chapter 2, it tells us that being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him, Jesus, and given him a name that's above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. What a Savior. Please stand together as we close with this song. Okay.
What a Savior, amen? amen? Well, church family, go in peace. We'll see you this weekend to celebrate the resurrection.